Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. Uh, I work at LogDNA. We do uh, aggregated log management, uh, both on in the cloud and on-prem. Uh, I've been doing infra work and DevOps at LogDNA for almost three years now, and I've seen a lot of uh, good and bad with scaling Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. Uh, so we'll have a booth outside. You're welcome to stop by and get a copy of the slides. Uh, we have a one-pager to hand out at the end. Uh, so uh, you know, if you have any questions, we'll I'll, hold, I'll answer them at the end. And I have some example pod specs as well if you want to go through them. So, all right, without further ado. Okay, so just doing a quick brief introduction to those who are not necessarily familiar with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is the distributed database. It's very popular for things like logging. Uh, the ELF stack, it's the E, so pretty important. Uh, you can actually scale it relatively easily because it handles clustering and sort of uh, and syncing tasks across nodes, which is really handy. And it's just generally kind of uh, you know, nice to have an out-of-the-box solution that works. Uh, and also it has its own hype chain, which is pretty cool too. So. Kubernetes, why would you want to run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes? I mean, it's already a, a VM. Do you want to add another JVM and then another VM in the Docker layer and then a VM that the Docker layer runs in? It seems like a lot of VMs, right? But there are benefits. Um, so Kubernetes, it's an open source container orchestration platform. As you guys probably know, this is container world. So I imagine you guys are familiar. Um, there's a pretty handy feature of Kubernetes. It uh, actually schedules all of your workloads onto the available resources, which is pretty pretty handy. And in addition, with some of the kind of more major cloud providers, there are integrations to auto scale the hardware too. So if you need memory or resources, it will just auto scale it and plop it on the new node that it just created. So pretty nice, you don't have to do it by hand. Um, in general, configuration as code, which Kubernetes allows for, and the static Docker images really enforce consistent behaviors across your infrastructure. And so running Elasticsearch in this mode is actually really convenient because you don't have to worry about a lot of the each step of bootstrapping it yourself or running a script or things like that. Uh, and Kubernetes has its own hype ship given the nautical theme. So it's Kubernetes. All right, let's jump into the actual meat of this. So at LogDNA, we run um, Elasticsearch in Kubernetes at scale. And this means a lot of different things, but for us, we need to run uh, our application and our setup uh, in both cloud environments as well as on-premise environments. You know, we want to be able to say, hey, we don't care where you want to host us. If we can live in you know, Amazon, Google, Azure, uh, a warehouse, uh, you know, your data center in Las Vegas, maybe a barn in Russia, I mean, who knows, right? We want to be able to run there consistently. And that's kind of what Kubernetes gives us with Elasticsearch. Um, we've made a number of modifications to the Elasticsearch interfaces and how we use them and what we limit and things like that to help sort of streamline performance, but that's not necessarily part of today's scope. Uh, we have in-house versions of Logstash and Kibana um, that we've built as we felt that these were not quite performance enough, uh, I guess performing well enough for us, so we've built our own. Uh, and of course, uh, the automation that comes from Kubernetes and the versioning and all of those things makes it really easy to help manage all of these different sites. So. Uh, we've done this before, it's interesting, I and mean, it is a new field, but we're learning as well. So if you guys have feedback from me at the end, let me know. Okay, so it should be pretty easy to scale Elasticsearch on Kubernetes, right? Well, uh, here's all you gotta do. Uh, so, you know, choose the version of Elasticsearch that works for you, you read through all the change log, not too bad. Uh, go through the hundreds of settings that are used to configure Elasticsearch and decide which ones are right for you, that's fun. And then once you've got that set up, you have to learn the query language, uh, which is not so much fun. And then uh, make sure you integrate that with your existing workflow so that your employees can use it. Uh, set up a Kubernetes environment, so uh, appropriately size the hardware to your use case as well. Uh, configure the Kubernetes workloads, that's the YAMLs, the pod specs, the services, the disks, all those things gotta be configured. Uh, then set up index templates and other configurations to make sure it runs smoothly. And of course, um, you know, troubleshoot issues as they arise with hopefully existing tooling. So pretty easy to do, right? Well, we're going to simplify this a little bit. So um, let's start with some same defaults. So we're going to use Elasticsearch version 5.5. That's what you, we use in production. Um, it works pretty well. I like it. Um, it solves a number of memory management issues that we saw in ES2. Uh, it's just generally pretty good. Uh, we are looking to move to ES6 and ES7 as well, but those are as they mature and as they start fixing some of the existing issues there, we start moving. So I'm trying to keep up with that as well. Um, we typically try and max out um, each Elasticsearch um, sort of node, uh, simply because it has a lot of overhead running with JVM and all those other things that are involved. So the bigger you make it, the more efficient use of the resources you can have. And so we typically size them around here. And this works pretty well, especially for um, you know, ingesting lots of data and throughput. So having that extra CPU and extra RAM really helps. Um, Creating your YAML configurations, we'll go over exactly kind of what are some of the more important or sometimes obscure settings you're going to need to run this. Uh, you know, it's not always obvious as to what's the correct setting. You can read three stack overflow posts and each one says something different. Um, this is what worked for us. So, uh, 
Index templates, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this. Index templates in Kubernetes are effectively a way of telling how data is saved to an index. Um, there are some really, really important settings in here that can increase your performance by an order of magnitude. I'm not joking, we discovered one and made our lives so much better. Uh, so we'll go over that too. Uh, and then of course, uh, managing the cluster once it's up and APIs and if some, some index gets in a bad state, how to go about doing so. so. Without further ado, uh, this is a tale of too many AMLs. I'm not sure how many of you used Kubernetes before. You know, do you? Yeah, so Kubernetes is in YAML, yet another markup language. Uh, it's really nice to be able to read as a file format compared to JSON. Uh, it has a lot of tabs and spaces. Uh, but um, we have a number of different sort of resource types of Kubernetes that we use. Uh, we use um, config2 config maps. Uh, one is for, to, for sort of the common Elasticsearch configurations that we sort of import into each container. Uh, it contains things like an index codex, a percentage of memory used by fields, a type of node. We'll go through the examples. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there's a script that we use to start up, and this is on Elasticsearch's doc page for Docker container compatibility. They have a random command to set VM file limits. Really interesting. And we'll go over that, too, and setting the heap size appropriately based on the resources assigned to Kubernetes. Whew. Okay, so there are three ES role types that we use, and this is actually an interesting sort of um, model, I suppose, that we've sort of developed over time. Uh, master nodes you've probably heard of, they sort of coordinate all of these cluster-wide actions. They're usually pretty lightweight in comparison to the data nodes, and they don't have a disk typically to handle actual data storage. Uh, and so those are really important to get started. They have an election, you elect an active master, and it goes about doing its thing. Uh, hot and cold, uh, the reason why we split them into hot and cold is because uh, if you make one massive node type and distribute it across all your indices, you really only need to have uh, really beefy nodes to ingest incoming data. The actual storage of other data can live on other nodes that aren't quite as beefy on the CPU side, because uh, they're only being used for querying and reading rather than for writing. And so that's one thing that helps save us a lot of hardware cost is by segregating those two types of nodes. So just something to think about. All right. so. Configuration notes in the YAML files. So I'm gonna go over this really quickly. Uh, we use Elasticsearch uh, Alpine just because it's nice and small and generally it's a good practice with Docker is to keep your images small. Alpine is a five megabyte Linux image, but obviously with Elasticsearch it's quite a bit larger. Um, volume claim templates is a field inside of the stateful set, which is a uh, form of Kubernetes resource that has allows for disk and identity. Uh, and it's really important because it allows you to dynamically request and provision disks. So that's really important to make sure that you don't have to manage each disk yourself. Um, there are important security context settings that you need, and this is where some of the obscure knowledge starts showing, which is you need to add uh, a security context for um, privileged containers. So it means privileged true, which you know, if you ask your security officer, they may not like this very much, but you need this to run Elasticsearch. Um, same with the uh, capabilities here. You need the IPC lock for making sure you have access to more file handles than usual, and then sys resource as well. Um, preemption, I want to mention this as well. So when you're managing a large, um, sort of set of nodes in Kubernetes where you're distributing things, sometimes small microservices take up, you know, like 10% of the node and you need that extra 1% to launch your elastic search pod because it takes up more resources. And so what preemption does is it says, hey, my disk-based pod is more important than your microservice. I'm gonna bump you off and be scheduled here. And this is super great for when you need to scale. Uh, because Kubernetes by default typically distributes a lot of its load. So really useful to set that up. And then lastly, oh, shoot. Uh, lastly, there is a startup script that we have, and again, these slides will be available. You will uh, have to email them to you and post them. Uh, this sets file handle units, set the max map count for VM. This is in the Elasticsearch documentation. Uh, we set some file permissions, and of course, I set the heap size for Java before we start the Elasticsearch application itself. So um, these are all things that are really helpful to do. And in fact, I, we could not run it without the uh, VM max map count. It just doesn't work. It's in the documentation. It's really strange. Um, Service discovery. So once you have your actual pods being able to launch, they need to discover each other and talk, right? You need to be able to say, hey, pod A, talk to pod B, because Elasticsearch is a distributed database, all the pods need to talk to each other. Uh, ES hot and cold um, nodes end up having a single load balanced uh, cluster IP service endpoint, so you can either insert data or query data, up to you. Um, and then ES masters are really important. Because they hold an election, they need to discover each other. You have to make sure that you have one load balanced cluster IP endpoint for handling both transport and API requests for data. And then of course, one cluster IP none uh, service, which is over here, for ES unicast discovery. And so what this does is cluster IP none as a service in Kubernetes allows you to uh, list all of the available IP addresses um, for the pods that are in that group. And so instead of being one load balance endpoint, you get as many masters as you have and they can discover each other. Super useful. I'm not gonna go into much detail on these two, because I think we're tight on time, but effectively this allows you to make sure your addresses are up to date 
And then when your master pod, if it has a probe that determines whether it's ready to launch, it doesn't fail um, publishing the address so that things discover each other without going into crash mode back off. So it's pretty useful. All right, startup settings. I know there's a lot of settings, so let me just kind of through this. Uh, there's a number of settings that we use, but I just want to touch on a few. Um, this is kind of a basic one, ensure memory lock is on, kind of important when you're consuming large amounts of memory. Um, adjusting the minimum master nodes based on the number of masters you have. So make sure that um, that's sized appropriately. Uh, Elasticsearch masters have an election, and the minimum number of nodes required present to make sure that they serve, uh, you know, be able to basically be a functioning cluster, this is the number that determines that. So just be aware. Uh, cluster IP none, so that service we talked about in the last slide, gotta make sure that the address of that service, cluster IP none service, is here, um, so it can discover each other. And of course, set the correct ES role and number of cores that you're gonna be planning on having that JVM use, so. Okay, index templates. How many of you use an index templates in Elasticsearch? Anyone? We've got a couple folks, okay. So there are a lot of settings in index templates too, and what's unfortunately a little bit infuriating is that index templates can't be set ahead of time which is really irritating. So you have to actually go and ping the API once the Elasticsearch cluster is up and then add your index templates, unfortunately. And so this is kind of an after, after the fact step. Um, we have a job that does this, but other people have different ways going about doing it. Shoot. Um, so there's a few different settings that I want to talk about. I'm gonna skip some of these. Just know that setting the number of shards that you use is helpful for fine tuning performance. The more shards you have, uh, the more distributed the load is, but also the more state that it has to be synchronized across the cluster. So just some trade off to be considered. Uh, refresh interval, uh, how often uh, data is basically surfaced after the insertion, after they're inserted uh, to be searchable. And so the longer this is, the better performance you get, but also the more latency you have for searching data. And then of course, uh, this one here. Translog durability. I'm not sure. Have, have anyone heard of this setting? No, it's a pretty obscure setting. We've, we, when we discovered it, by default, all of the translog writes are uh, synchronous. So you wait for each write to go through for the next one goes through. And when we turn that to async, our performance increased from 5 to 10x, depending on the cluster. Like, that's an insane increase. We, we kicked ourselves for not discovering this earlier, but highly, highly recommend this setting if you get a chance. So, and don't worry, these slides will be made available. All right, so now that your cluster is set up, how do you manage it? So we use Cerebro, because um, we're using ES5, but if you're using ES2 and lower, there's about the same creator as a program called KOPF. It works slightly differently, but Cerebro is nice in that um, you basically run a single pod, and then you can connect to your service endpoints for your masters and just switch between them as much as you want. And it just gives you a nice visualization of all the different uh, indices. So this is an index. Um, these are the different shards. The bright ones are prim primaries. The, uh, you know, dash lines are secondaries. So you have rhythm data across nodes. Uh, and then, of course, these are the nodes themselves. So just an example of what it looks like. You can do a lot of things with Cerebro. You have shards around, you settings, but not everything is doable through, 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 through Cerebro. So that is what APIs are for. Um, we use Insomnia. It's a nice tool. It's a little GUI to sync. Uh, API calls, but you can of course use curl. I do too sometimes, it's great. Um, but these are some of the, the API calls I wanted to highlight that we use a lot. Um, so cluster health. You guys have probably heard of this. This is the, just the standard health endpoint that just outputs you know, useful information about the cluster. So it has status green, so it's stoplight colors. Green, good. Yellow, not so good. Red, bad. And it's pretty basic, but it's helpful to determining how the cluster looks. And Cerebro actually displays this in the bar at the top. Uh, there's a number of nodes that belong to the cluster, uh, and of course, um, pending tasks. So if I can find it here. Number of pending tasks, and that's something that we look at a lot because if you want to see what the pending tasks are, they're right here. You have a large number of pending tasks. That means that operations that require cluster sync take a while. Things like writes might time out, uh, shard, shard allocations might time out, put mappings might time out, all sorts of things that are bad. One thing you can do if you run into the situation is to actually um, lock shard allocation, and you can do that by hitting this block symbol. And that typically clears up your pending task list, and you guys remember, uh, can counter that before. Um, in terms of um, shards not allocating, I'm not sure if you've ever guys have seen unassigned shards in your cluster, anyone? No? Okay, well, if you get to this state, it means that the shards that are shown here, hold on, shards that are shown here can't figure out where to live. And sometimes they retry and they retry and they retry and they stop, and they just sit there forever until you do something. And so one of the things you can do is effectively um, flush the cache, and then force the shards to retry. So sometimes you'll have a bad event in the cluster and you'll need to rerun this again. So I would say we use these the most out of any APIs on Elasticsearch and we recommend them, so. All right, made it to the end. So wrap up, uh, there's a lot of stuff we covered and a lot of these sound like obscure settings, but I just kinda of wanna leave you with some important tidbits. So 
Use the correct security context, view limit, and VM settings. I know that's a lot of things to remember, but when you're starting, when you're running Elasticsearch in a Docker container, you have to realize it was not designed for a Docker container. Just straight up. And this is some of the things you've got to do to work around that. Uh, there are native concepts in Kubernetes that can really help you. It helps make running ES easier. Service discovery, volume claim templates for disk, preemption, all of these settings help you manage this without you having to do much. They're little quality of life improvements that really help you not have to deal with things. Uh, and then index templates, of course, have a huge impact on how well your ES cluster runs. There are way more things you can do than what I mentioned, but those are, in my opinion, the most important. And lastly, of course, uh, we and we recommend managing um, EFs as a combination of GUIs and APIs. So that's it on the Elasticsearch talk, but um, we do have a booth, number 215. You can email me at ryanlawdna. I will send you sample YAMLs, slides, whatever you need. Um, and uh, we do have a one pager on the way out. I also have some sample YAMLs I can go over if anyone has questions uh, or if any people have interest. How am I on time, by the way? Nice, okay, so I have time. So I'm actually gonna go over some of the stuff. Actually,